My name is Melissa Walden, and I work for the Center for Transportation Safety. It's part of the Texas A&M Transportation Institute here in College Station. Um, I've been working with the motorcycle program for almost a year now. Um, previously, I had been working with several other types of projects related to traffic safety. Um, obviously, I'm probably a little different than all the rest of the speakers since, you know, I will be the only female. But, um, <laughs> uh, but you know, besides the obvious, you know, my background's I'm an engineer and I work in traffic safety research, so that pretty much qualifies me as a nerd, but not, um, but, and I, and I don't ride a motorcycle. Uh, you need nerd. Everyone needs a nerd. So, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm planning on taking lessons this summer. So, but, um, but it's, it, for me, it doesn't really matter that I'm not a motorcyclist. I hope it doesn't matter to you because really what I think helps me to be up here is the fact that I'm, I'm really curious and I care a lot about what people do and how people transport themselves across the roads here but, you know, whether it's recreational or for just general transportation. Um, I, I, I know that crashes can be prevented. We call them accidents a lot of times, but they're not. Um, and I really think that if, if we just looked at it in terms of it's not just a motorcyclist, it's the person, then we could all be on board and in the same, uh, on the same spot. So to me, it's personal, just like it is personal for you. And what I want to try to do is, yes, I'm a data person and I love numbers and whatever, but what it's important to know is that even though we're looking at crash statistics and we're looking at crash statistics either on the federal level, like Ken talked about, or on the state level, which I'm going to kind of give you a little bit more closer down to the Texas view, um, they're, they're not just about a bunch of numbers in a spreadsheet or a database or, a, or on a computer program somewhere in a cloud. They're, they're actual reports about what happened to people on our roadways. And for those of you who are not familiar with what a crash report is, you're, the information that we get and we analyze is only as good as what is put on that report. So as we go, talk through that, we're going, to, we're going to help understand about some of the questions that you ask about well, why isn't this happen and why isn't that happen and why don't we know this information and some of that data is connected and some of it's not so I really want to look I want to I wanted to look at these things in terms of details like what about that incident not what about that data set so um, over the last few months we were looking about really about what was behind those numbers and we're in the process of, of, of doing an analysis on a, a, a small set of de data, 100 fatal motorcycle crashes and 100 serious injury crashes. They were randomly pulled. We did not, we, the only thing we tried to account for is rural versus urban because we didn't want to pull a whole set of rural or a whole set of urban. So we, we looked at the overall state statistics and we, we, so we pulled our crashes from that. Um, so I think it's about 60-40, 60, 60 urban, 40 um, rural. And when we're talking about rural, we're talking about anything outside of a jurisdiction, a city, a town of 5,000 people. So in places like Brazos County, it doesn't take much to get to rural. And, and same thing in some of the larger counties as well. Um, this is only a sample. But it, is, it really does reflect what's going on across all of these serious injury and fatal crashes. Um, we're planning on doing a larger study of all the crashes in two, uh, for 2014, but this is what we have to look at now. So in, when I was preparing to do, start this study, I have other great people that work with me. And some of them never seen a crash report before, never been in a crash. And so I pulled one out of the sample just to explain to one of my colleagues what, what was, what's a crash report all about. Um, and the one I just happened to pick is one of the ones we're going to talk about today. There were two. Um, and and it, it is all about making it personal. Believe it or not, the crash happened in March. The first crash happened in March um, 18th. Uh, in Amarillo, Texas. And the one I originally picked happened a little, almost at 3 a.m. 
And when I went back to look, just to give this guy kind of some understanding about what happens with these types of things, I went to the internet and I pulled up, I was looking for his obituary because I knew it was a fatal. And I found that in that weekend, there were three crashes. One guy was seriously injured, two were fatal. And it was interesting, and with, within one hour, there were two crashes six miles apart. This is where the first crash happened. Um, it was a little after 2 a.m. The motorcycle crash was at an intersection. The rider's name was James Smith. He was a little over 40 years old. Um, at the intersection, it, the, it was involved with, this is one of the ones that was involved with a different vehicle. He ran into the back of a pickup truck. Very common intersection crash, regardless of whether or not it is a motorcycle or, an, or another car, or another type of vehicle. Um, he was ejected from the bike. Uh, he did have his helmet on and he sustained some serious injuries. But when you look beyond the numbers, one of the things that we find is that this is what the rider was riding on. This is what the road looked like when he was riding up to that intersection. It's two o'clock in the morning, dark motorcycle, dark um, clothed person. You know, he had a, he had a full helmet on. Um, he likely, the driver likely pulled into the intersection not seeing him because he was further down in his sight distance and the rider was traveling up so he probably didn't see the, the so everybody could have been doing everything right but unfortunately, fortunately he lived but unfortunately the crash happened he was pretty severely injured. Then about 45 minutes later um, this is a residential area, the last one was industrial, uh, six miles away on a residential street, um, a kid named Justin uh, Warder, he was 21 years old just a couple weeks before the crash happened, um, he was riding his 200, um, 2001 Yamaha, he had purchased just a few months earlier, uh, he, did, he was not licensed in the state of Texas, he was from Arizona, um, and the bike was registered in Arizona, so we don't know what kind of training he had. He was traveling at a high rate of speed, and he misjudged a gentle curve in his own neighborhood less than one mile away from his house. As I said, it was a little before three o'clock in the morning. He hit, the, hit a curb, and he was thrown from his motorcycle into one of these trees and was killed. Um, his motorcycle went on to the other side of the street and crashed into the house. So these are real people. This is somebody who lost their lives because of a motorcycle crash. And so it's, to me, it's personal. These, are, these two crashes an hour apart represent all of the common issues. And trust me, I did not look for this. It was just randomly out of the, the stack. You know, there's single and the, there's multi-vehicle crashes with motorcycles and with other vehicles. Um, there's speed is a huge issue in almost it, the vast majority of the crashes that happen, whether it's serious injury or, um, or fatals. Safety equipment, some had it on, some didn't. The alcohol, um, one of the things I forgot to mention about the, the young man who was killed, they suspected alcohol. Um, it was not listed as a, um, as a variable on the, on the crash report and there was no BAC testing. There was BAC testing ordered, but it never showed up on the report. Don't know why, it's just one of those things that happens. Uh, the physical environment, the intersections, your sight distance, the geometrics of where, the roadway. A lot of these things happen on straight roads, not on curves. So we don't know about the training because that, that has to be linked, not automatic, it's not automatically linked with the crash information. We're working on that on this pilot study with John and his group. And then your behavior, which is really the only thing you can control. You can't control that driver's behavior or somebody who doesn't see you or somebody who doesn't care about you. Um, you have to re be responsible for your own behavior. So what's the big picture? Let's move back a little bit back from these 200 crashes we're looking at and in Texas, over the last four years, and this is just motorcycle and just 
um, fatals and serious injury crashes. So 30% of them happened at an intersection. Uh, 35 of them were run off the road fatals. Um, and so about 30% of, of, the, of the total crashes were run off the road in general. Um, but, but the fatals were definitely more represented than the serious injuries. Only 3% of them happened in a work zone. Um, and, that, and when I say work zone, I mean it could have been an active work zone, it could have been a maintenance zone, it doesn't necessarily have to be a full-blown work zone that's manned for it to count. Um, and it's pretty evenly distributed between single vehicle crashes and multi-vehicle crashes all over the last four years. We've recently been working with TxDOT on the Strategic Highway Safety Plan that, that kind of brings together all types of um, traffic safety data. Motorcycles happens to be one of the emphasis areas. So this is one of the things that we shared with those workshops in terms of the number of fatals, and this is just 2013, just fatals and serious injuries. So you get an idea about the distribution between rural and urban um, and, and the tracking of those numbers um, across the years. Um, one of the other things that, you know, just because I know data sort of gets confusing, and it's like, hey, your numbers are different than this person's. The um, crash records information system at TxDOT is a live system. So if I pull data in April and then I pull the same year set of years in August, it could be different. Maybe not significantly, but it could be. And then it will be a little bit different from the FARS data at the national level until that, till that, that data is fa finalized. This gives you an idea. The, the, this is how we broke up the state into regions for the Strategic Highway Safety Plan. And it gives you an idea by TxDOT district. So for here in, um, in the Bryan district, you know, we have multiple counties surrounding here. Same thing with Houston. But it gives you kind of an idea about the regions of the state and the number of crashes that happened that were fatal and serious injury. One year? Yes. This is 2013 only. So what do we mean by taking a snapshot of the data? Um, as I said before, only fatal and serious injuries. Um, we're talking about rural and non-rural no, rural and non-rural um, crashes. We're talking about looking beyond what numbers are just in spreadsheet, looking at the narrative, looking at the, the illustrations that the law, law enforcement has provided on those um, provided on the crash report, and also looking beyond that. What type of bike was it? What kind of, what color was it? And then as we get, we'll work with John's group at DPS, and we'll figure, we'll, we'll be able to figure out whether or not, or when they had training, or whether they had training at all. We're a little limited on the out-of-state people, but we can, we'll, we'll be able to try to get some of that information as well. We want to paint a picture of the problem. It's a lot easier to understand. So who and what make up this group of people um, that's a representation of, of all the crashes in 2013? 95% um, are male. Um, most of them are um, riding alone. Less than half of them have, have had some sort of motorcycle endorsement. Now again, there's a, there's, there was a small percentage, I think about 15 to 20% that were out of state, so we don't know that for sure. Um, but they did, if they were out of state, that meant we couldn't tell whether they had a motorcycle endorsement based on how their, their license was set up. Um, the, uh, a wide range of ages from late teens to 70 years old were, you know, and beyond were represented and then a, a, t a very diverse set of bike bikes were represented as well. This gives you an idea, and this is, might be more information than you, than you want to ever see on what type of bikes, um, but we had, we're very fortunate, we have an intern that's working with us in Austin who is um, getting ready to graduate from St. Ed's. Uh, she's a really dynamic individual and very interested in motorcycles, and so she's she went through all the crashes and classified the bikes in, in order of size and type. Um, so, you know, you get an idea that it's the cruisers and the sport that are in, are mostly representing 
um, the bikes here on both serious injuries and fatals. And here's the size of bikes. And you know, you may, you may agree or disagree about how these were divided and we definitely want your input because this is just a, um, like I said, it's a pilot study and we're trying to get some more information. Yes, sir. Melissa, that also follows uh, the uh, statistics of the breakdown of motorcycle registrations. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, 60% of all bikes that are sold at least in our area here, are a cruiser mm -hmm. and bike, and, and that pretty much mirrors the demographic of sales, you know, well, good. and the families of motorcycles. So, just so everyone's aware. Well, good. Of that. And and we do we that's that's one of the other steps is that we're we're looking at registrations, and we're also looking at like besides the training, but the number of licensed riders, because it's important that we put things into perspective in terms of the population that we're, we're talking about. Where did, the, where did these crashes happen? Mostly on local roads. Unfortunately, the vast majority were within 10 miles of their house. Um, a number, frighteningly, within a mile. Um, more happened on straight than curved roadways, and you can get, a, get an idea about that. And this is based on the tech stock classification on the, on, the, um, on the crash report. This gives you an idea about the road type. So, you know, mostly two-way, um, you know, the 47% is on the not divided. And when do the crashes happen? June in 2013 was the deadliest month. Um, there were about, there were 54 fatal crashes and almost 600 serious injury crashes. They happen both day and night. So it's not, and we'll get a little bit more information in just a second, but it's not, it's not just a nighttime problem, which I'm sure many of you know. Um, and mostly, obviously, on weekends. That's pretty, um, pretty common thought. This gives you an idea by day of the week when, they're, when the crashes are happening, with the Saturday and Sunday being on the ends. And here's the times of the day. And I, said, I did separate them out between fatal and serious injury for this. So, so why, why, are the, why have these, these particular subset of crashes, why have they happened? Um, you know, they, a lot of them were single vehicle crashes. Um, but there were a, a good representation of multi-vehicle crashes. There were even several, I believe, four that were of, of the fatals that involved another motorcycle instead of another um, four-wheeled vehicle or, or tractor trailer. Um, Less than 30% were wearing helmets out of this subset. Uh, we don't know what other protective gear they were wearing because it's not recorded that way on the um, crash reports. Uh, speed was a major factor across the board. Um, and you know, I know I'm telling you a lot of what you already know, but you know, it's kind of like, hey, I, my intuition is proved correct. Um, failure to yield right away was the major contributor on the multi-vehicles. And then there was, on the fatals especially, um, I think it was probably upwards of 90-something percent that the rider and the bike were in some sort of dark clothing. And whether that's in the day, or dark clothing and dark bike, which, you know, a lot of, most bikes are dark, um, but that, Putting the dark, you know, a protected rider or a non-protected rider on a bike that's harder to see, whether it's at night or during the day, is, you know, it's. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it's a, it's an issue that really reared its head in this analysis. Um, and we've got to start looking in terms of the your vulnerable users, whether just like a pedestrian or someone on a bicycle, anyone who's not protected by a cage is vulnerable. And so how do we, how do we educate the public 
And there are projects on, on, on the way, I mean, in process that are looking at that. How do we educate the public, but how do we also educate fellow riders to understand how vulnerable they are? Um, you know, like we had um, uh, one of our teenagers drove a, a low profile black car um, because their stepdad was really, really generous. And uh, she, people never saw her. And it was, she would, she was actually very scared to drive at night a lot of times because people just didn't see her. Same thing with, with the motorcycles as well. And, and she was surrounded by a, a, a car. Yes, ma'am. No, uh, of, of the motorist. It was mostly the driver. You know, the driver making a left-hand turn um, is the majority of it. They're making a left-hand turn and the rider is going straight. Just like with regular intersection crashes, that's the major issue with inter all intersection crashes is somebody's turning left and somebody's going straight. Yes, sir. Mm hmm What percent right. does that seem to the, the, uh, the motorcyclists? Right. What percentage of that was the failure to yield on the part of the car? Yeah, I mean, it's probably close to 75 in this group. I mean, it's hot. It's the main thing. There are other characteristics, you know, like when you record on the uh, crash report, other characteristics, and they are, those were onesie and twosies. Failure to yield was the, the, the major thing on multi-vehicle crashes. And, and just to add also to that, the issue that you were touching on earlier just a few minutes ago before you were talking about this continuity, the ability to be able to see the rider. Um, these drivers are driving in dark clothing, they're driving on dark bikes, they're, they're in environments where they're not visible. And that was something that was really kind of interesting to, to know because each one of the each one of the, um, the narratives in those crash reports, the drivers always say what? <laughs> and that was that was a common theme across all the data, um, is that they couldn't see the riders. So constituity is a huge issue and it's something that Ken talked about when we were talking about the um, um, the information that we were DJ. But the continuity is an issue and, and, it, and it resonates throughout the crash record. Well, and another thing, I just, and I'll get to y'all in just a second, but when we were going through the Strategic Highway Safety Plan workshops, one of the things we talked about with bicycle riders, again, people don't see them. And someone brought up an interesting fact that doesn't, I mean, it doesn't, it seems pretty like, duh, why didn't you think of it? Is that so much exercise gear as well is black. Um, and, you know, even though, you know, you want to introduce the, um, the reflective types of, of things on your clothing, people don't do it because they want to look skinnier riding their bike. And so they're wearing all black. So I was like, okay, I guess that makes sense. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's why in 2009 we focused on changing the fines for failure to yield, mm -hmm. upping the penalties. Right, I remember us talking about it. The issuer to help us. Mm -hmm. They keep saying, oh, that's my court eye, you know not being implemented like we were hoping. Mm -hmm. and because we saw that it's over 70 percent failure to yield and not just in motorcycle involved accidents, right. in all vehicle yep. involved accidents. Failure to yield covers a multitude of seasons. Mm -hmm. And we just said there's a spot we can pick and we can try to do something but it's we're not getting cooperation from the courts. Yeah. And some of the law officers still don't know that that's a law. Right. Well, and, and two, on the part of the rider or the driver, you don't necessarily, you don't expect someone to be there. And so it is difficult if you're traveling, whether it's a car or a bike, when you're traveling at 70 miles plus, it's difficult to make those adjustments because you just didn't expect it to be there. And as far as visibility, I'm a railroad engineer too. I remember. I drive a train, it's 18 feet tall, 12 feet wide and yellow. Mm -hmm. Two headlights down low, two up high, and I hit a lady on a crossing and I got out and, you know, trying to help her and I said, why did you get on the crossing? She says, I didn't see you. <laughs> I said, ma'am, it's a track. 
Don't you want to say, you mean, don't you want to say sometimes, oh no, you didn't look at me. I mean, you just didn't look. Well, I saw her head turn that way. Yeah. She just didn't see it. She wasn't looking. She yeah. wasn't, she may have actually visually looked and didn't mm -hmm. see what she was seeing. I, I don't know, but that, so, I mean, how more visible, I got worn as black, and I can't be more visible or vocal, and they still don't see you. Well, you know, people have told me, exactly. There's no accounting for people behavior. Yes, sir, and I'll get to you in a second. I say we're talking about conspicuity here, but we've got a really good example over here. This Look, Learn, Live display over here gives us an example of what we're complaining about here. The color of the motorcycle is virtually irrelevant because the profile doesn't present the way mm -hmm. for you to see what color right. it was. If that was white, yellow, or some other high visibility mm -hmm. color, you're not going to see that much of that in relation to, I mean, it's got a headlight on there. Right. Uh, the it's rider not much. themselves wearing a very neutral color, blending in here, dark colored helmet. Um, I mean, the rider's gear is definitely going to be a bigger part of mm -hmm. what's going on rather than the bike owners. Well, if I'm on a train in a what th what chance does a motorcycle have? Nobody matter what they're wearing. Well, and unfortunately, we don't know what they were wearing on these crash reports because it's it's just not. I mean, we know if they were wearing a helmet or not, but we don't know. A big uh, component of our conspicuity issue also is uh, rider education uh, works because uh, if it's lane selection and lane position is a big, big issue with uh, related to con conspicuity, especially in these kind of situations in high traffic or environments. And it's it's one thing that it's an educational component that we really need to get out to the motorcycle community. Uh, I've always been a big proponent of let's make sure the motorcycle community takes ownership of the portion of these issues that they should take ownership of. It's under their control, you're exactly right. So it's it's one thing to say, oh my God, look at all these failures, you ride away first. But it's another thing to say, all these failure failure to yield right away crashes are the result of driver inattention or a lack of motorist awareness. That's not the whole picture. Part of it is is an educational component on the port, part of the motorcycle. And we have to take ownership of all of our so we can't ride like that. So, you know, the statistics are great, and we need to collect more and more statistics, but there's an educational component there uh, and a cultural component that we just have to try to part. There's a, uh, in the new uh, MSF book coming out, the new curriculum that is rolling out as part of uh, the update here at the state, there's a new element that's included in those classes called presentation. The whole idea is teaching motorcyclists how to ride and it deals with lane positioning and what you do in <coughs> such a way as to make yourself more visible to other people. The MSF has recognized that. The old one, I forget it was in there before. It was CMBC. Two questions. CMBC. Two questions. I need to do power PR sale on that issue. That's a huge issue. There's a gentleman over here. Yeah, I'll take it over your Yeah. Can you get on something also over here in the city that the, the, the ladies look but didn't see him? You don't see what your eyes see. You see what your brain interprets right. your eyes. And True. Your brain only interprets what it thinks going to be there. So it's looking for a car or a truck. It's not mm -hmm. looking for a motorcycle, a bicycle, a dog, or a pedestrian. Mm -hmm. and so, Melissa, or a train. I want to bring, I wanna bring up. Yeah. yeah. I want to bring up the argument that last year we also talked about. You know, we need to raise the fine to the four wheeler that made the left turn. In the motorcyclist, it, that you can raise the fine as high as you want to. I mean, it's not going to be a deterrent to a driver that does not perceive a motorcycle rider right. as a threat. I mean, they, you know, they're in a big old car or a train, and you know, they don't perceive, you know, that little bitty motorcycle rider coming down the road as a threat to mm -hmm. them. They, and True. So, you know. Again, going back to taking ownership or uh, responsibility as a rider, you know, to get in control, hey, that person might turn in front of me, 
get a slower speed, mm -hmm. ready to position yourself in, you know, where you can escape, where can I bail, you know, is, it has got to be taught to the public first because uh, just slapping people in four, you know, on four wheels right. with, you know, quadruple the floor, you still have a dead motorcycle ride. Well, and we've seen that not work with impaired driving as well. I mean, the, the penalties have been raised significantly on impaired driving. Oh, okay. And they haven't, people are, hasn't changed behavior, but it also has, it, it's, we're not getting people, we're getting people pleading um, that they don't, the way they're pleading and the way they're dispos disposing of the cases is not getting them the help they need or punishment, but the re help that they need. So, um, and like, like pedestrians as well, is that you're walking along, you know, somebody's car, whatever the reason is, yeah. you have a pedestrian walking along a, 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 sh a road with no shoulder, you don't expect him or her to be there. And because they're not, they're, you're, yeah, I mean, have you ever seen yeah. the video with the people and the gorilla in the room? Yeah. You just don't see it because that's, you're expecting people, same thing. And so we do, it's, it's a two-way street. Yes, sir. I mean, this whole thing about conspicuity, I mean, for the last two years, my whole existence has been, how do I get, how do I crack that mentality, of the motorcyclist mentality, of conspicuity is important. Mm -hmm. I mean, my existence has been about, you know, getting right. them to realize that they've got to be seen up there. That's my business. Mm -hmm. And it's just, there's a way of thinking that I haven't been able to overcome for the people who come onto my website. I mean, it's pretty obvious you've got to be seen, mm -hmm. but they still don't get it, and it's just creating a mindset. And, and you know, if you guys have any ideas how to, how to achieve that, yeah. I, I'd love to hear that. There's a study out just recently about the motorcyclists being smaller and the misperception of the distance. Mm -hmm. They can't yeah. judge that distance because of the size of that yeah. person on a motorcycle. They're having the difficulty, and that could be contributing to some of the crashes. Right. Even though they see this. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Well, um, I think next year we might be able to help you because we've got a project um, that's uh, probably going to start up in the fall, I guess, Gary, about looking at rider attitudes towards wearing safety equipment. What, what is the motivation for those who do? Why do they make that decision to do it and put a message out there that promotes that use? We don't want everyone, it's kind of like the choir speech. You know, you don't want the whole choir being the people who participate. And so we're looking at different ways of getting, reaching out at events and other, other types of things to reach all kinds of riders who have all kinds of experiences.